Well, greetings again. What a privilege to be together and to be able to look at God's Word again. And let's look at another incident in the life of the old prophet Elijah. Man, he was quite a guy, a brave man. Kind of strange, but he had a trust in God that was unbelievable. Today I want to talk about the challenge. And I want you to see, we have a tendency to look at Elijah. I, I am always awestruck by Elijah. But the writer uh, James, in his little book James, says Elijah was just a man like us. And so the focus is not on the man, it's on the man's God. And his name, Elijah, means Jehovah is my God. Today I want us to look at the challenge. It's an interesting story. And the whole idea is let the real God prove himself. The passage we want to look at today is in 1 Kings in chapter 18. It starts at verse 19 is where, it's where I want to start. Elijah says, he's just, uh, he just made himself available to King Ahab. They have found him and he comes on the scene with pointing his finger at Elijah. And Elijah said, no, wait a minute. It's not me, it's you. And there's a rebuke that happens. And last week, a couple weeks ago, we talked about this. But, but look at this. So, verse 19. Now, some of the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. We, we, we pronounce it Carmel, but, it, but over there in Israel they call it Carmel. And I guess that's, I'll just call it Carmel. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Ashtoreth who eat at Jezebel's table. Can you imagine fixing lunch and dinner for that many prophets? Man, that's nearly a thousand people, just, just the prophets of Baal and Ashtaroth eating at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I, Am I the only one of the Lord's prophets left? But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it in pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. <laughs> well, the contest is on and let's take a look at it here. What I'm aware of is that... Um, you could lose your head going to a king like Ahab. He had taken other people's heads off that confronted him. John the Baptist confronted Herod, and Herod just had his head taken off and served on a platter. And so it's kind of risky to threaten a king or challenge a king, um, sometimes even to just be in a king's presence when you disagree with him. So I wonder, did King Ahab respect the prophet Elijah too much to kill him? Was he afraid of Elijah's God? Or was he just curious and kind of maybe just wanted to know? You know, it could be that old Ahab was a speculative idolater. Not, not real sure about anything, but try a little of this and try a little of that. He had no discernment between truth and falsehood, nor commitment to them. No discernment between right and wrong, good or evil, or commitment to either one. Whatever got him a little glory, whatever got him a little money, and um, whatever got him what he wanted, that's what he went with. It looks to me like that he had no real spiritual life. But he seems to have been fascinated with religion. So Baalism, Ashtaroth, they were kind of sexy religions, and um, I can understand how a dirty old man might kind of get into that stuff. But Jezebel now was evil. She was an evil woman. And she was a worshiper of Baal, of course. And the record shows that she had the prophets of God killed. So 
you know, she was a hard-hearted old gal. Now, the first point that I want to make is that Elijah may have been kind of a freewheeling prophet, kind of out there doing his own thing. But he says, in this, in this scenario, he says, Now, some of the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now, bring them along. We're going to have a contest. And so there, there is what was said. Now, I don't read anywhere that the idea of a contest was God's. It seems to have just been Elijah's notion. And so, you know, I, I've kind of been afraid to step out, but um, I don't see where God instructed Elijah to set up this contest. So how could Elijah be so bold? Was, was he presuming on God? Was he just assuming that God would, um, would do whatever he asked him to do? You know, it'd be kind of embarrassing to be up there in uh, these kind of terms and to have God not God say, well, you know, that was your show, not mine, and so see what you see if you can pull it off. And I've seen that happen when preachers went on some kind of an ego trip and they wanted to have a healing service or they wanted to be spectacular somehow. God just let them do it, and he let them fall flat on their face. But, you know, Elijah was a kind of guy that wanted things to be right. He was a prophet. He spoke for God, and he knew how to talk to God. He trusted God absolutely, and he knew God's will and way. So I believe that old Elijah knew that God wanted to reveal himself to his people. Now listen, this is not an evangelistic event. This is not calling the unbelievers to God. This is what we would call a revival, a spiritual revival. This was a matter of calling the covenant community back to the worship of their God the God they were in covenant with, the God that had shown himself real so many times before. This was a call back to sincere worship. Now, Elijah knew that there had to be repentance before there could be rain. And God had been very specific about, if, if you fall away, if you go to turn, if you turn and go to worship other gods, the rain will stop falling. My blessing will stop falling on the promised land. <clears throat> You see, Elijah understood the laws of God, and he understood the nature of mankind, that his heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, that he has a tendency to believe if it's convenient, but he falls away from believing as soon as things are going well. And Elijah also knew his biblical history. For instance, when King Solomon had dedicated the temple in Jerusalem, in his prayer, he has these words, When the heavens are shut up, and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way. <clears throat> forgive and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. Well, since God hadn't been specific, it seems like the old prophet Elijah was on his own to be creative, and man, was he creative. I wonder if I would trust God enough. But amazingly, Elijah's cocksure that God's going to answer by fire if he sets up the contest and he spells out the term specifically, God's on the line. I was on an airplane one time, and it was kind of an interesting ride. I don't know whether you've ever been on an, uh, an airplane and had to sit, sit next to a fussy kid. But there was a businessman sitting in the aisle seat, and next to him was a fussy kid. And his mother at the window seat, and uh, she, was, she was not able to control this kid at all. He was completely out of control. So the businessman opened his briefcase under the seat and pulled out a notebook, grabbed his pen, and said to the kid, You know, I'll bet you're a pretty good artist. Why don't you and I draw a picture? And so the kid took the pen, and man, he just made some scribbles all over that page and just angrily... Um, made a mess out of it. And the businessman said, wow, that's amazing. Man, you are a good artist. Here, now let me add a few strokes to it. He added a few strokes, and first thing you know, 
a picture form that was absolutely amazing. The businessman flipped the page and said, man, that was fun. Let's do it again. You are a really good artist. So the kid grabbed some, grabbed the pen, and this time it wasn't reckless. It was, it was lines and, and just random lines drawn on the page. And business said, oh, that's amazing. Man, you are a really good artist. Now let me make a few strokes. And so he made a few strokes, and first thing you know, he had made sense out of all of those scribbly lines and a picture form that was absolutely awesome. You know, I think sometimes that's the way it is with God. We put our strokes on sometimes in anger and sometimes just thoughtlessly, and God comes along and he takes his turn and amazing things result. You know, when you and I are in a loving, obedient relationship with God, we can't make a move but what he can use it to his glory. After all, he is God. He's the real God. He's the God who knows. He's the God who can. The second thing I see out of this story is that Ahab may have been a, a gullible king. Now, I don't know. But the challenge was pretty nondescript. Elijah didn't spell out the terms when he gave Ahab the challenge until they gathered on Mount Carmel. King Ahab may have been in politics so long that vagary was kind of normal and natural for him, but he bought into the challenge without even asking about the terms. Now, it could be that the king was just naive. I've seen politicians that really are naive. But what if he really wanted to know for sure which was the true God. Now, he may have been ready for a change down deep inside. On the other hand, he may have just wanted some excitement and a bit of diversion on a particular moment in his, in his political career. The third thing that I see here is that Israel had become an ap apathetic people. And so the comment is, um, it screams it loud and clear, but the people said nothing. They're neither for or against. They're not excited about it. They're just there. They were willing to climb that mountain. I've been there several times, and uh, it, it's not a tall mountain like we have out west. It's, it's kind of a big hill, flat on the top, and has kind of a triangular footprint, and it sits right on the edge of the, Estra, the plain of Esdraelon, and it's um, it's near the the valley of Megiddo. Incidentally, Megiddo Hill of Megiddo Har is the word for hill. Megiddo Har Megiddo. Do you hear that? That's the place where the staging for the last battle is going to be. But um, <clears throat> here we are at old up on old um, Mount Carmel, and uh, I wonder if these um, king and and queen were intimidated. I wonder if these prophets of Baal and Asherah were a little bit afraid of what might happen here. Maybe they just didn't know who to vote for, so everybody's on board just to see out of curiosity. So Elijah issues the challenge forcefully and clearly. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord, and I want you to notice that that's all capital, so that's the Y-H-W-H in Hebrew, the high and holy name of God. If the Lord is, and then God, Elohim, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. So here we are. The challenge is on. I want you to understand that truth addresses a perpetual challenge to all that is false in religion and politics, any unbelief or, in, uh, or disobedience. Truth always is a challenge. And so, truth often is poo-hooed. They attempt to brush it aside so that it doesn't interfere with falsehood. And if falsehood, one falsehood is just as good as another falsehood, so all religions are the same. Unless you put Christianity in the mix and then all of a sudden there is one that stands out way above all the others. Moses had challenged the magicians of Egypt long ago. 
and they faked the first few, but you know what? They could not be 100%. They could not duplicate all of the challenges that God gave them. Now, Elijah challenged the priests of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel, and uh, <clears throat> they went to work, just like he had told them to. And Jesus Christ, in our day still, challenges our religiosity, our moralism, our corruption. And we can excuse it to ourselves and sometimes to others. We can explain it away and we can rationalize things. But I have to tell you, if it's not truth, it won't stand. Anything that is false is going to fail you, and it is going to fail altogether and utterly. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You know, anybody can tear down, but it takes some talent and some discipline and some serious resources to build things. I read in John's Gospel, chapter 3, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Now, these are principles that are stated in the New Testament, but they're principles that were real in the Old Testament as well. Matter of fact, I've been saying recently, and it's interesting to me the surprise for some people, when the Apostle Paul wrote in Timothy that all Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness, he was not talking about the New Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. Paul was talking about the Old Testament when he said all Scripture is inspired. And you know, that's the Bible Jesus used, and it's been effective. Now, I'm not discounting the New Testament, but I want you to understand that all Scripture is inspired of God. So, true religion produces the highest and the finest character, the highest and the finest social fabric, and the highest and the finest excellence anywhere. It produces absolutely ideal condition. It changes people, it changes their society and their culture when it's allowed to do what only true religion can do. So what evidence is there that Christianity is truth? Well, what evidence is that, that there is a sovereign, omnipotent God? Now, I believe in creation, and I believe that uh, God did it in six days. I just cannot, I just can't see how logic would allow you to think that that creation could be done over a long period of time. Everything is too interdependent on everything else. You can't stretch it out more than six days. It had to all happen quickly because things can't exist without other things being perfectly in place and fully functional. So what's the lesson back here in Elijah's day? Well, what the story says is that something's wrong in the kingdom. Uh, not that kingdom. This kingdom. Something's wrong with the kingdom of our heart. We are not worshiping God. We have abandoned our first love. And Mount Carmel is a, is a type that is a contest um, for everyone, anywhere, and always. So the, the, the contest that let, let the true God show himself. And that works anywhere. It works every time, every day. And I, I, I have to tell you, I believe people are watching to see which God will answer with fire today. They're watching our lives to see if the God we believe in is real. <laughs> Somebody told me last night a story about a preacher, about a, a fellow. No, oh, they, they met. Several guys met. They began to pray for rain. It hadn't rained. There was a serious drought. These farm boys wanted rain. Their crops were at risk, and so they began to pray. Someone noticed that one of the farmers came out of his house in the morning with an umbrella, and they asked him, what are you doing? He said, man, you can't pray for rain without expecting God to answer. So he had his umbrella along because God was going to answer their prayer. Now, the really scary thing is that you and I set the agenda. We let people know what we really believe. We decide what the contest terms are in our day 
like Elijah did in his day. It could involve victory over a habit or a vice, a re resolution to a, an un unsolved relationship. It could involve a provision that has to be a direct divine answer to prayer. It could involve wisdom, as in Daniel's case, and uh, the three Hebrew children, or could involve courage, as in David, King David's case. What I'd like to tell you is that you and I need to give God a chance to prove himself in our day, in the real circumstances of our lives. God wants to do that. And if we'll let him be our God, like Elijah, let God be his God, absolutely, unconditionally. People are watching. And everybody kind of wants to know for sure. So, what's wrong with letting them know? What's wrong with letting them see who the real God is? Wow, what a story. Pray with me, would you? Father, we have uh, played fast and loose sometimes. We've called ourselves believers when we really, really haven't believed. But this is the day for the contest to be on. People need to know. They've laughed long, and they've laughed and mocked and, and uh, made stupid remarks about Christianity and about the God of the Bible and about the Bible. It's time for us to boldly step forward and let the contest prove who the real God is. And so I ask that in my life and my friend's life watching here, that you will give us a chance to let others who are watching see that you are real, that you are the only God, and that you answer prayer. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you.